Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? What were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that the flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the cloud or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Lord God, we give thanks to you that we can gather here and attend to these words and ask questions, even as you ask questions of us. We come with our questions and our concerns this day. We pray that as we gather and as we listen and we attend to worship, that we might find some answers to some of those questions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we saw last week, Job wanted his day in court because if, as his friends alleged, his own sins caused him to suffer. And so he wanted to see the evidence. But, as the, as the story goes along, because Job wouldn't admit to anything, one of his so-called friends, his name, a man named Elihu, decided to take a different approach. Rather than blame Job, Elihu told Job to stop questioning God because God is too busy and too important to bother with your questions and your problems. Just give it up. Stop complaining. God's, God ain't going to answer you any way you want, right? After all, and here's where Job and Elihu goes, Elihu says that Job should consider the wondrous works of God. Yes, yeah, just a look around at creation, because when you take in the grandeur of creation, you'll realize just how small you really are in the grand scheme of things. So don't bother. God's busy creating. Not time for you, Job. Now I get Elihu's point about the wonder and the grandeur of creation. Cheryl and I recently visited the Upper Peninsula really for the first time. And we took a boat trip out along uh, Paint Pictured Rocks uh, National Lakeshore. Some of you are nodding. You've, been, you've done that. And we took it into Prominent Falls. It's not quite as uh, big as, as uh, Niagara Falls, but hey, it's a pretty good sized falls. Along with a lot of other points of interest in the UP. It's a beautiful area up there. Scenes like this produces a sense of awe at the wondrous works of God. And, and you do realize how big the universe is and how small we really are. Even the Earth, when seen from space, is a rather small place. So why would God bother with Job? And as you ask that question, why would God bother with you and me? Now, Job, when we get to chapter 838, 
Job never really gets to respond to Elihu's more sophisticated response to his complaints because, you know what? God shows up ready and willing to take on Job's questions. Because apparently, despite what Elihu said, God wasn't too busy to talk with Job. However, there's a big however in this, God doesn't enter the conversation gently. No, God appears in a whirlwind. Now, when we lived in Kansas, we lived in Kansas for three years. And what we learned when we were there is that when you see a funnel cloud forming, <laughs> seek shelter. Just go find a safe place. But that's not what Job does. He just stands there stunned. And it might be because of the whirlwind, or it might be simply because God showed up. But for the first time, Job is speechless. He has nothing to say. Now here's the question. When God appears to Job, does Job, God answer Job's questions? And the answer is, some of you read the text that, uh, earlier this week, and you know, God really doesn't answer the questions. In fact, what God does is, barrage Job with questions that just overwhelm him. In fact, if you follow, it starts in chapter 38. I just read some portions of chapter 38, but it goes on to chapter 39, and it kind of continues on to chapter 40. And you can feel like when, when you're done with that, you just kind of have to feel for Job. You know, how, how did he manage to hear all of this with this whirlwind all around him? Well, and when the, when the questioning comes to a close in chapter 40, God asks Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Because anyone who argues with God must respond. The question is, if you were Job, and you had been chastened by this barrage of questions, how would you respond? What would your response be? Now, before you answer that question, consider for a moment the way the author of Job describes God. Perhaps like me, you're not sure you even like this description of God. But maybe that's the point of the book. It helps us ask the question, who is God, and does so in the context of what appears to be a rather broken world. It celebrates God's creative acts, and yet God at times in Job seems capricious. So what are your expectations of God? When you think about God, what are your expectations? How do you visualize or understand God and God's nature? And if, like Job, you had the opportunity to speak with God face to face, what would you say? How would you act? Now, I know, we pray to God. We talk with God. But God remains unseen. But what if, putting yourself in Job's place, God is there appearing before you, and you can see God, and you can hear God in a way that we normally don't? How would you respond? Well, as you ponder that question, I'm going to bring it down a little bit more down to earth for us to think about. Think about just this morning how you would react if the President of the United States suddenly showed up here at church, just was randomly here in Troy and just showed up at First Presbyterian Church. Now, I know we all have questions for, for our presidents, right? You, have, you probably have pages of questions. Doesn't matter who the president is, you have your questions for the president. You might even shout at the president on TV, right? <laughs> but standing face to face with the president might be a bit more intimidating than facing down a TV image. So would you? Stay quiet? Or would you 
you run up and barrage the president with all of your questions. That's what you do. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to speak with a president, or a governor for that matter, but I've had opportunities to speak with people I greatly admire. Once upon a time, I was at a conference, and Jürgen Moltmann was the featured speaker. Now, Moltmann is one of the great theologians of the post-World War II era, and I've read most of them. He's written a lot of books, and I've read most of them, and I love them. He's influenced me, and I would love to sit down with Jürgen Moltmann and chat with him about theology. And you know what? I even had the opportunity to do this. You see, at that conference, I was staying in the same hotel as he was, on the same floor. I came out of my room to go down to dinner, and there he was, sitting on a bench in front of the elevator. And I had my opportunity to talk with my hero. And you know what I did? I turned to Jürgen Moltmann and I said, hi. How are you this evening? And then the elevator opened, I entered the elevator, and my chance to talk theology with my hero. Now I realize that might not be your cup of tea. You might want to talk with Jim Harbaugh for that matter, or Mel Tucker. I don't know who you want to talk with, someone you admire. But at that moment, I had the opportunity, and I froze. Getting back to our different story. Now, it's, we've got to remember that, that God didn't give Job much of a chance to ask these questions that Job had been asking. God just appeared out of nowhere in the form of a whirlwind and then fired this long series of questions at Job that could easily be summarized this way. Who are you to ask questions of me, the creator of the universe? Don't pull up your pants, <laughs> tighten your belt, and give me your best answer. Answer me this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Mm. Well, when we read the book of Job, it's easy to feel sorry for Job. It's like, I don't want to be in that position, do you? In fact, it's even easy to dislike this picture of God. Because God sometimes seems a bit capricious, you know, said to Satan, go and go and do whatever you want with Job, and see what he can do. And sometimes, like in this passage, God even appears to be something of a bully. So is it the kind of God who warrants our worship? I think sometimes we have books and passages like this, and Job especially, is a bit unsettling. It challenges the way we think about God and the world, and maybe that's the way it's intended to be read. It forces us to think carefully about how we view God. When God appears to Job in chapter 38, God asks Job if he has sufficient knowledge and wisdom to debate the big questions of life. God asked Job, do you know what I know? Can you see the big picture? Were you there when I created this world you inhabit? In fact, who gave you the wisdom you possess? And Job can't answer the questions. So when God finishes prosecuting him, that's what that's a bet I was thinking Perry Mason. Kind of God is Perry Mason here. All Job can do is answer, this is in chapter 40, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? Now, I'm assuming most of us gathered here this morning believe in God. That's why you're here. I also imagine you bring to church your own ideas about who God is. We may even bring our questions and our concerns with us. In fact, we may bring our doubts with us church. And that's because the world around us doesn't always make sense. It's one thing to stand in awe before God's grand creations and give thanks. Done that. 
It's another thing to watch the news and hear about the chaos in Haiti or Afghanistan or here in our own country and wonder why things are the way they are. When we face the dark side of life, we may wonder where God is in all of this. And it's a good question to ponder. When we read the Bible in search of answers, we need to remember that the authors often use metaphor and analogy to describe God. And these metaphors and analogies have their limits. So while the book of Job raises important questions about God, I wouldn't recommend looking to this book, the book of Job, for answers to the questions of the nature of God. You should look elsewhere. The book of Psalms is a great place to go, and the Gospels. But not Job. But what it does is force us to wrestle with difficult questions. Like we saw last week, one of the questions is, why do bad things happen to good people? And then the further question is, is God responsible? Perhaps the answer to those questions will come in the form of another question. In fact, it might be a barrage of questions. It could be that we simply don't have enough wisdom and understanding to find a fully satisfying answer. However, that doesn't mean that we should stop asking our question of God. After all, God tells Job to pull up his pants, tighten his belt, and give it his best shot. So don't be afraid to ask your questions. Could it be that the answers to our questions will come as we continue the conversation with God and with each other? So as we continue the conversation about the th way things work in the world, it's worth remembering Paul's words to the Corinthians. He told them to put away childish things to act like an adult, that's what pull up your pants and gird your loins, that's what it means when Paul talks about act like an adult. And Paul says, remember that for now we see in a mirror dimly, but a time will come when we will see face to face. But for now, we know only in part. But the time is going to come when we will know fully and we will be fully known. In the meantime, until we get to that point, Paul says, faith, hope, and love apply to these three. And the greatest of these is love. Job invites us to ask our questions, even if not all the answers are available to us. After all, we're not God. But in the meantime, as we look at the world through this dimly lit mirror, carrying all of our questions with us, Paul lets us know that until we see God face to face, do this. Let us live in faith, hope, and especially